Let me check back and forth. All right, sounds good. Um, how much time do we have tonight? What do you think? About seven? Okay, so I'm going to keep talking for about five hours or so. Y'all welcome to just leave, log off whenever you like. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the purpose of this is going to be really for beginner level, no experience or early experience. Um, part of the issues that I had early on when I was learning how to hack was I would hear things like, here's how to do a privilege escalation, or here's how to do lat move, or here's how to do random recon, recon all the things, right? I didn't know how it fit together. So that's really what the purpose of this talk is going to be, is we're going to start from the outside, breach our way internal, uh, do actions on target, um, uh, and go from there. Uh, I'm going to give a couple examples of various different techniques while we're going, but it's not going to be a technique-focused talk. It's going to be more a methodology focus talk. Those who are online, if you have um, ideas as I start talking, continue on, uh, you know, uh, put into the chat uh, some things you have. Those of you here that are a little bit more experienced, if you have a, a really good story or, or uh, a good tool that's used at various different levels, by all means, let us know. Also, if you have any questions, uh, let us know too. This is not going to be more of a lecture. It's going to be more of a kind of give or take kind of thing. Uh, I tend to get really excited as we go. If I start taking off clothes, getting naked and drunk, just let it happen and be. We have kids here, so I'm going to try to at least keep on a thong. All right. So we're going to talk about breach. Yeah, huh? Boy, everybody got here. Okay. So who am I? I'm Tinker. That's about it. All right. Um, mostly Dallas Hackers Association. Waterfall's in the uh, audience here uh, tonight. Waterfall founded Dallas Hackers Association, uh, and he needed a stooge for people to uh, throw tomatoes at. Um, and so I help uh, Wirefall out at Dallas Hackers Association. Beyond that, um, uh, I'm a red team technical lead. I've got a small team for a large company. Right now I'm doing internal uh, across a wide spectrum. In the past I've done uh, more consulting, and that kind of goes back and forth depending on, on what's needed. But pen testing, red teaming, uh, I have experience full scope, so systems, networks, applications, web, mobile, uh, cloud, physical breaches, social engineering. Basically, if there's something that you can protect, I'll, I'll try to break it and we'll go from there. Um, I am. Look at that. Just kind of popping off. I was accidental. A little, little sultry right there. All right. <clears throat> so let's start beforehand. We're, we're coming from the outside. So want some audience participation. Uh, those of you that are online, um, uh, Phil is reading the chat, so he'll be able to relay it and, and I'll I'll let, let you guys know what's going on. Okay, so we're outside. All you have is the name of a company. That's it, right? And maybe validation, maybe a single URL that you know which company it is. Our goal is to get to the internal network. Call it cloud, call it on-prem. It doesn't really matter for the sake of our, our discussion. I want to get to the internal network. How do we breach? High level, what, what are some ideas? How would you approach? If I said right now, your stuff? No, who's your, what's your name? I, I, I'm blind, so I don't know what's going on. Here, hold on. Let me triangulate. <laughs> Diana, it's a pleasure to meet you. Diana, I want you to break into a company. We'll call it Acme. How would you, how would you break in? That's entirely fair. How do you think you'd break in? How, how about, how about I don't, don't worry nothing. I give you, I give you $100,000 right now, and I say, get inside and get access to the network. How would you approach it? There's no wrong answer. You, you, I mean, personally, I, I, I grew up with the idea of a, of a crowbar and just break into the front door and beat people up. That's not a good idea, but you can. All right, so what would you do? Try it. Okay, so Waterfall likes the idea of being a janitor, and he's going to go physically break in because we're talking about that, all right? Oh, you need a job. Okay, so he'd actually apply. So Waterfall says he'd apply as a janitor, and, and after 20 years, he'd milk them for money every two weeks. And he'd lie, and while he was lying, he'd have a pretext of cleaning the toilets. That's, that's a pretty slick way of stealing money. All right, yes, sir. Okay, so you, uh, a gentleman here said that he would park in the parking lot and attack Wi-Fi. Absolutely a wonderful way to do it. You could either attack the, the internal Wi-Fi itself, maybe pop some uh, pre-shared keys, 
or maybe you go into uh, guests and try to hop over for guests. It's very good. We have Wi-Fi, we have physical, and we have long-term, long-con, insider threat. What other ideas do we have? If anybody's online saying stuff, yeah, Phil has somebody online. Okay, so, so he would enumerate websites I'll go off of, and a couple things on websites. You can either hack the website itself to get access to the underlying host and from the host pivot, or you might find uh, websites that have login prompts that maybe would get you some sort of internal uh, access, whether you'd, uh, uh, you know, going through a remote desktop, Citrix, or something along those lines. That's fair. Yes, sir. Do they have RDP open to the internet? <laughs> They're not safe anymore. Yeah, absolutely. So, so any kind of external network, uh, so RDP, uh, SSH, Telnet, which still exists, anything that give you remote access through that. What else? So OSINT's really good for recon, but OSINT won't get you in. Let's focus right now on getting in, and then we'll work backwards from there. All right, what else? Yes, sir. Phishing, very good one. You send a, a fish to a person, they either click on uh, an attachment and give you a shell that way, or maybe you redirect them, capture some creds, and use the creds then to, to log in some other way. Let's see. I think we've covered pretty much everything. Is that right? From, from my social engineering, yeah. Password spray against a, uh, against a remote login. That's, those are pretty good wide areas, wide attacks that you can, you can breach in. With that in mind... What are some ways that we can recon for those things? High level, say, say we want to prep for it. There's two purposes of recon. One is gather everything you can get so that you can get as much information. Maybe an attack will present itself. Or you have a specific attack in mind and you want to recon to it. Let's start with physical. What if I want to break into a place? What sort of recon uh, can I do? You can dumpster dive. You absolutely can go to the place dive into their dumpsters and do some active recon. I have a picture of that here in a second. I'll show you. What else? Stakeout. So you'd go close, pull out the binoculars, play it cool, do that. It's perfectly fine. Yes, sir. That's a very good point. And it six talks about uh, construction documents. If you can get a third party that did construction or the city has uh, uh, site maps and site plans there uh, for auditing, sometimes they'll have it. If you go to <coughs> You said it's I square. Okay. Uh, right. But, I mean, how, how much are you going to get from breaking into this place? I mean, we're going to get rich, right? It's going to be great. So uh, uh, isquare.com was one. Um, I've done LoopNet, which is real estate information. So a lot of times if I'm going to go hit a place, I might pretend to be them or I might pretend to be whoever owns the, the building, right? A lot of places rent out that building. You go in as whoever owns the building, they'll let you in, right? I mean, it's worked for me. Uh, anybody online talk about stuff? Yep, you can do, uh, Shodan's really good for uh, um, uh, a variety of network services. Uh, I saw InMap if you want to hit networks. Um, what happens if you want to do a fish and you want to send them malware? What's some things that you can do to find out uh, what kind of security systems they use? Say again? Yeah, so you're going to send an email to them and you got a, you got a pretty little pretty little malware on a little virus, okay, that, that, that you're going to pop off internal. But a lot of places have antivirus. You're not just going to willy-nilly send it at them. How are you going to prep a little bit? Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Can you get me to the next slide? It's not clicking. Yeah, so, so init 6 makes a, a, a good point. Um, it's very rare that companies will themselves advertise overtly. There, there's a, something around that, but overtly they rarely advertise it. But how many people have sat in on vendor talks and they say who they protect, right? You get access to all those, they'll give you a list of where they're at. I did hear job postings. So uh, let's take a look at what's up on the board right here. On the left, 
are two job postings. I put them together. They look like one. And on the right is a resume. I went to indeed.com. I tried to block out the, uh, the specific information. This was taken today, right before I came over. You're welcome to put it in and find it yourself. Don't do anything that I wouldn't do. Don't get caught. With that in mind, on the left, this is a job posting. We need this person right now. And we need them specifically to have experience in Juniper firewalls. We run Qualys vulnerability management. We run CrowdStrike endpoint protection. Below, you need to have knowledge today of Microsoft Windows Server 2003. Okay, you guys are running end of life. I don't know if that's patched, that's awesome. If you go down to the bottom, we've got Cloud Firewall, SolarWinds, so on and so forth. That's job postings. If you, if you find job postings of their security, of their network engineer, of their messaging, which would be email, um, you'll find exactly what they're running because they'll ask you to have that specific experience, right? Um, also, you can flip it around and look in current resumes. If you go to indeed.com, you don't have to pay anything to see resumes. You have to pay a dollar to call the person, but just looking at resumes, you can search for the name of the place and they will tell you, this right here is an information security manager, head of security operations. This resume was valid as of two days ago. And he says, at this place, he had a $1 million annual budget, um, and he specifically ran QRadar, FireEye, EDR. He has CyberArk, Proofpoint, email protection. That's a good one. Uh, Rapid7, Nexpos, and Qualys. So I can maybe run Nessus and find things that he didn't find. Um, so Silence, Endpoint, uh, and a couple other things. So now I kind of know what sort of things are protecting him, and I haven't even touched any of his stuff. This is passive reconnaissance. This is OSINT. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So this individual said, go and do MX lookups uh, and look and see if they have DMARC, et cetera. I'll even take one step further, find out where their MX record is. If it's their domain, chances are it's either they cloud hosted it or it's on prem. But if it's something like PP hosted, well, that's proof point or Mimecast or, or, or Google or what have you, you'll know what sort of protections they have. If you can spin up a, uh, an account that goes through that as yourself, you can send email to yourself and see if it passes um, uh, virus detection. If you get it past that, then you know that it'll get past them. So already right here and off of, I mean, this right here has proof point in it, but MX records, um, you can create an entire lab that fits their architecture security-wise and customize your malware until it gets past that lab. And at that point, you know it's probably gonna get past email protection. And when they download and run, it's probably gonna get past their own antivirus. That's the point of, of, of reconnaissance. You have specific targets in mind and, and in, or specific attack vectors in mind and you wanna, you wanna actually uh, exploit those. And so your, your recon goes towards that. Or just by reading this, I might go as an attack of opportunity to find out who's running Windows Server 2003 as their active directory as their domain controller and just go after that. If I can get internal and, and their domain controller is running 2003, I don't need a pivot, I can go straight forward and just pop a shell, right? So it just kind of depends on what your goals are. All right. To your point on the MX record, that's a very good point. People said NMAP, we go to active scanning, active reconnaissance, right? There's a variety of ways to do this. Difference between active and passive, who knows? at least for the sake of this kind of uh, talk. When we talk about passive, what's the difference between passive reconnaissance and active reconnaissance? Going out and touching it, that's exactly right. Passive reconnaissance is a strip club. Active reconnaissance is when you pay $100. All right. Male strip clubs are a little bit different. They're a little bit easier. It's only $25 there. Um, <clears throat> so one way we are talking about phishing, um, exactly what we're talking about with DMARC, a lot of times, you know, you can send, the, the way that phishing works, uh, you, can, you can do it in a variety of ways, right? You can, you can try to be them, right, and send it internally. That's where DMARC and SBF and all that kind of stuff kind of goes into place, right? I like going, if, if they have, uh, you, you start doing subdomain enumeration that we were talking about early on, and they find that maybe there's a mail thing. Uh, if you do uh, uh, a port scan, you can go on Shodan and just look for SMTP at that point, port 25. A lot of times you can, 
just go straight towards them. And kind of the, the benefit of SMTP is that it's, it's uh, you know, the, the protocol's easy to read. It's, it's ASCII language, right? Um, you can talk to an email server directly. You know, it might, it might take a username and password to get into the client, right? But just talking to the email service, a lot of places are configured to not even need credentials. So you can talk directly to it. You talk to it with English. It's English with, an, with a British accent, right? You don't say hello, you say hello. Uh, look at that. Yeah, I got some hacker puns there, shit. You type in E-H-L-O, and you gotta say it out loud. Um, and a lot of times you just do a mail from whoever, receipt to, I don't know, the CFO, and then you send your data, it's fine. Here's an actual fish that I sent using this, where I, I went to the, the SMTP server itself and just sent a message. It says, this is, uh, from the CF or to the CFO from the uh, uh, the CEO, and so cool thing about this is uh, well here, here's the message. Sorry to bother you at call, but I'm in a meeting. I have a lead and want to slip in before our competitors. I need you to send 10k to the following account. I have an a ABA number, an account number, an ID number. I said we don't have a lot of time for this, but I'll fill you in this afternoon. Very excited. I'm not even trying to pop malware. I'm just trying to get money. I don't care about hacking. I care about what I can do with the hack. I care about what I can make money off of. I want to see them with ransomware. Cool, they'll give me money. I want to pop shell, dump IP, sell that for money. Cool, I'll get money. Or I can just ask for money, and I get money, right? Cool thing about this is because it's Active Directory and Outlook and whatnot, because I sent it from that actual person using their domain, it matched it up with the picture. Now, obviously, I changed it with a little, you know, Tyrell uh, Willick and whatnot, but that was the actual picture in their client. It matched it up for them. That's going after the domain itself. A slight uh, tick to that is when you do a uh, password spray and get into the actual, uh, uh, actually log in to the client, whether it's Office 365 or, or OWA or what have you, you do a password spray, you can get into the actual account. And at that person, you go through, it doesn't matter who it is, you go through the send messages and see if they sent a document recently. If they did send a document, take down, download that document, put in malware into it, and send it back to the person and say, hey, use this one instead. Now it's sending from an act. That's not a fish. You've hijacked account, right? That's a cool way to do it. All right. A couple other ways to do it is if you're going from the outside, you can try to do typo, um, you know, uh, 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 one-off typo. What's that? Yeah, domain squatting and whatnot. I don't like domain squatting personally. By all means, do it if you want to. I found you can do what looks like a legitimate domain, you know, I don't know, secure dot secure email dot TV or whatever, and put their company as a subdomain. At that point, you're not, you're, it doesn't, you know, you're not looking for the ones and the L's and, and the zeros and the O's and whatnot. It's a real legitimate domain. One thing to note that if you create your own domain, whether it's typo spotted or what have you, if you send it right away, a lot of uh, blockers will block you because you're unknown. So make a bunch of good domains and sit on it for at least uh, a month or so until it becomes normal and it'll get past those initial checks. The flip side is you can go to expired domains, expired domains that they used to own. If it's something like a company that they don't have a single uh, domain and a chunk of subdomains where they spin up a new domain every single time, including when they're breached, <coughs> experience, um, you don't need a typo squat. You can literally do whatever you want in the name and because they have a culture of spinning up new domains, it will get past them. You go to expired domains, these are domains that were, were spun up at 2000, 2005, no one ever created again, but they're there to take, cost $20, and that has a history. That has a good history, and you can use it to get around them. Yes? Uh-huh. Yeah. Absolutely. So SMTP was created when we just needed it to work, right? DMARC tries to get around it. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So by all means, look into that. You have a variety of options in phishing. Choose whichever one works for you. All right. <clears throat> we were talking about physically breaking in. Who said dumpster diving? Was that you, Rex? Rex said dumpster diving. This right here is a colleague of mine. We went and did a dumpster dive. That's him. If you look closely to the picture, you'll see that he's actually wearing a bulletproof vest. 
they uh, employed armed guards and didn't want to get shot. So uh, they decided, you know, whenever you're going for dumpster diving, the idea is you're not going to sit in the dumpster and read the mail there, right? You're going to grab as much as you can and get out. So what do you do? Do you grab a big white van? Do you grab a pickup truck? Do you bring a, uh, a giant U-Haul? You could. You just do a dump truck. Or do you try to blend in, see what's over there? Do you drive a sedan and try to shove as much trash as you can go in there? Either one's fine. There's no right answer, no wrong answer to that, but you got to give and take. If you think you can get a shit ton of, you want to empty an entire freaking uh, dumpster, bring a dump truck. Get in, get out in five minutes. I mean, if you got a, if you have a small crew that's, that, that, that's putting all in, by all means do that. If you want to blend in a little bit, toss it in, that's fine. Most dumpsters are held up. Some of them have locks. If they have locks, they're cheap. You can pop them yourself. Most of them aren't locked. Even if they are, a lot of times you just hop over the top. Cool thing about dumpsters is a lot of them will have like uh, walls around it. Take a look at where the security cameras are. Chances are you can hide behind the dumpster, hop in and out, and security camera will never catch you. If they have a compressor inside, don't die. <laughs> All right? Um, uh, if you know what you're doing, you can unplug it. You can try your luck. Chances are, if that shit's all compressed in there, I, I'd leave it. Uh, 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 there's a misconception with hacking that, you know, depending on what it is, you've got to hack into it. If the thing's too hard, fucking move on. Like, seriously. A lot of times when I'm going after a database, it's patched. It's like, how, you know, somebody might say, hey, how are you going to hack into this? And I go, I I'm probably not going to hack into that. I'm going to find out who can log into it. I'm going to hack into his shit and use his credentials to log in normally. You know, we're not, don't make it hard on yourself. If you go there and they got freaking dogs out and, and fully automatic, you know, machine guns, that shit's a compressor. And it's like, why don't I just let it be? You're, you're not going to get around, uh, 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 the, the trash can that time, there, there's going to be a better way. A big part of, especially when you just need to hack in, is finding the easiest way in. Go ahead and do that. That's fine. This one over here, this was a social engineering attack. Uh, I'm going to be going to layer eight and giving a talk on how I breached a physical location solely using social engineering. I didn't use any hacking devices. I didn't use lock picks or nothing. I let, I, I conned people at each step to open the door for me. This right here is a security picture footage that they, had, they pulled afterwards. One thing about security is most security footage is used for response, not for detection. What do I mean by that? It's rare that somebody is looking at that going, oh my God, we're being breached right now. What usually happens is something else keys them off and then they can go back within the last week or whatever and see what they can find to hopefully get you. Know, you. One big thing is most security cameras is really, really dodgy so even if it's looking at you like the jpeg pixelation is so high just steal that fucking truck they'll go oh my god my truck was stolen but they're not gonna know who did it it's fine don't get caught don't break the law all right with this one right here after the fact i told him what i did i had conned my way past three people and at this point i had been handed off to the security guard and the, the employee said hey this guy needs to inspect sprinklers in the server room because he says they're special can you go badge them in to the security room? Because that person couldn't. The security uh, guard received a valid offer, or a valid order, rather, and, and they did nothing wrong. I mean, they validated with their person. That person validated. That security guard was good. Security guard walked me past, put down a handprint, then put down a, a, a digit in there. So we got bas biometric multi-factor authentication on that. Let me in. She didn't know what I was doing. I said, they actually told her, to let me in. They didn't say why. And so I told her, oh, I'm, I'm doing a server upgrade. So as long as I don't steal anything and I don't punch people in throats, she's fine. She went in there in the server room, sat down while I, in front of her, plugged rubber duckies into various servers and popped shells left and right. She didn't care because she was told that this was authorized. Oh, went backwards. Need to go forward. I don't understand technology very well, so... All right, one thing I want to talk about that we didn't really mention as an attack vector for breaching, we talked about, you know, getting into logins and whatnot. One big way is the traditional technical vulnerability, right? This is what, what I think of when I think of hacking, whether I found a zero day or I use an old day or what have you. Um, can anybody see which one this is? Does anybody know what MS-1710 is? Eternal Blue, does anybody know where Eternal Blue came from? The NSA, yeah, yeah, we think so. Right, so Eternal Blue is a name that was given to some exploits. It, it, long and short, a, a group calling themselves um, 
the shadow brokers, which is either uh, a mass effect group or the Russians. Goddamn Russians. If there's any Russians on, uh, uh, online, they could receive a, uh, um, they leaked out a bunch of uh, tools from who they call the equation group, which essentially was the NSA. Long and short, when it came out, it was like, was it Fuzzbunch or whatever the, the binary package was for that. Um, I'm not going to be running any NSA tools that went through the Russians and it's binary. I'm not going to run that willy nilly. I might pop up a, a, a lab and do it. Um, two hackers by the name of Genomagis and, uh, and Zerosum, they reverse engineered that NSA tool and ported it to Metasploit. So at this point, they actually made it really tiny, really efficient, which tells you, I don't know if I want to say they're more efficient than the NSA, probably tells you a bunch of other bloatware that the NSA put into it. Um, but what's really nice about this is, hey, if you got a point where it's a known bone, it's very rare that I'm going to find a zero day myself. If I have enough time, and if it's an IoT device, maybe I, I might find it, but I'm not really good at that kind of stuff. I, I'm better at the idea of understanding what attacks are out there and trying to bring it to bear. From a Marine standpoint, I'm not custom crafting my rifle. I'm grabbing a rifle from the armory and then going and using it. It doesn't matter though. If you like uh, zero days, by all means, lean on that. If you're really good at lying and conning and, and you have a history of broken relationships, by all means, go to social engineering. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, play to your strengths. You, you wanna be able to know a lot of things, but definitely play to your strengths. A big thing killed the technical vulnerability from outside though. And that big thing is ransomware. I hate ransomware, except for when I'm using it. Um, it used to be in the past that people, when they thought of hacks, they thought of you know uh, 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 spray painted websites. So you could breach in through them through some janky ass 300 day, and uh, uh, nobody would know the difference. People didn't realize you can sit in memory and it's still hacked. I went into one place where when I was hacking. I came in on another hacker hacking into them. It's like busting in the front door and seeing a Russian smoking on the couch. You're like, oh, buddy, I'm sorry. I, uh, oh, shit. Uh, I, you know, all right, professional courtesy, I'll give you five minutes, but you got to go, man. <laughs> you know, a lot of, the, a lot of the, the, the doors I'm going through, there have been plenty of trots. I've walked in on probably seven to eight breaches, where as a pen tester, I was the one who found the breach and had to kick it off to DFIR, right? Um, what's that? Um, when I go into a, uh, the, the question was, how did you know? Uh, a lot of different ways. I'll give you one example. It just kind of depends on it. I'll give you one example. I came in through uh, a technical vulnerability, popped the shell, and then ran Netstat. Netstat says what it's connected to. My idea is, hey, is this, it was a, it was a web server. Is this connected to some backend databases or something? I'm going to then go to, to the databases. At that time, there was a connection going outbound uh, to an outbound IP address. Um, uh, on port 4444, 4444, which is default Metasploit, well, yeah, which is like, bro, change your port number, right, to an IP address in St. Petersburg. Now, I don't know if the person was in St. Petersburg, because, you know, VPNs and proxies are a thing, but I asked them, do you have any assets in St. Petersburg? And they're like, no. I'm like, do you have any person that's going to bounce through a VPN in St. Petersburg? They're like, no. I'm like, bro, you're, you, you need to look at this right now. I found evidence of, I'd go in and, and, do a, a, a task list dump of, of what programs were running. I'd see what programs were installed, et cetera, because I might use that to hack into further things. And when an American oil and gas company is running Microsoft Word that's a couple years old with Cyrillic in it, I'm not saying I'm like leet DFIR over here. I'm just saying that shit ain't normal, okay? So that's, does that answer your question? Okay, he's nodding. You know, I guess that answers his question. So a big thing happened with ransomware. One second. Big thing happened with ransomware is anything that's an easy thing that's a known vulnerability, chances are ransomware has automated that shit and has already hacked into it. That includes things like default credentials and misconfigurations that are easy. So the Mirai botnet is all default creds. WannaCry is all this shit right here, actually. Um, and so it used to be that you could scan and then look for known vulnerabilities. You can still do that, but the easy shit is usually already picked off because they, they've needed a patch because they've been breached three times and finally convinced themselves. That said, look for it. By all means, look for it. Um, you're going to find things that aren't easily scriptable or you might have to, you know, web apps are really hard to, to scan for known vulns. So you might find an attack vector that lets you go in. By all means, look for that kind of stuff. SQL injections all the time on bespoke code, you know, like standard libraries, maybe what have you. So 
don't not look for it. Don't, don't give them more capability than, than, they, than they have, right? And, and don't neglect to jiggle every handle. I'm just saying that it's a lot more difficult nowadays. Yes, sir, what are you going to say? So if we walk into an active breach, I'm assuming you're asking a question, y'all. If I see an active breach, I try to cut the proceeds with the person. All right. I don't know about y'all. Right. Yeah, so usually when I, when I hack, I'll, I'll, I'll get in, I'll patch the way that I came in, I'll kick everybody else out, and I'll do a turf warfare. I'll do king of the hill. That shit's mine, yo. And if that motherfucker came in through port 4444, he's a fucking script kitty, and I'm going to own this shit. All right? Why would you ever let the organization know that you're in them? What, what would that do for me? Oh, a pen test. Yeah, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the individual was asking what to do in a pen test. I don't know. What, I mean, you got clients, you're testing BICs. I mean, do what you got to do. I, I, does anybody here a pen tester? If you walk into an active breach, what would you do? Oh. Okay, setting the stage. That's an interesting question. All right. Okay, so let's do, that's kind of a, a nice breadth of ways to breach. For the sake of this discussion here, let's do something that usually always works for me. I'm not a skilled hacker. I'm a very diligent and persistent script kitty. All right, so let's go with that mindset. Say we, we go to DNS Dumpster, we run Spiderfoot, or we run GoBuster Derby against a subdomain uh, uh, list, right? And we find a bunch of subdomains, and many of them have logins. Well, shit, let's log in. Okay. That seems straightforward. What do you need to log into a place? Say again. Username and password? Password? Pa password? You're looking at me kind of shaking like this. I don't know what's going on. Y yes, sir. What, what do you need to log into a place? Yeah, the information. You need, you need the account information. That's exactly right. How old are you? Nine. We got a nine-year-old back here who's yelling out the answers. That's great. Yeah, you need, you need the account information. You need a username, and you need a password. Okay, let, let's start easy. How do we get a username? Well, I, I'll say one thing. I, I've got a colleague of mine. She, she tends to call up a place and say, hey, we're, uh, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Sally from your travel agency for your company. Uh, I got you booked ahead of Detroit tomorrow, um, but I don't have a confirmation. Do you want to go ahead and do that? And the person's like, I didn't fucking book a shit to Detroit. Who, who would go to Detroit? You kidding me? I'm from Detroit. Sorry, mom. Um, <clears throat> and so she goes, okay, that's fine. I'll go ahead and cancel it. Make sure you get your money back into your, your business budget or what have you. Um, let you know that we'll never ask you for your password. Uh, can you verify your domain and uh, your username? And they're like, well, I, here's my username. How do I get domain? Okay, well, press uh, Windows L and read off what you see on the screen. She goes, cool, thanks. So they read it off and like, okay, everything's taken care of. Ignore that you heard from us. We've gone ahead and turned that off. Have a nice day. Okay, well, that's one way to get the username. But shy of calling up and asking them for their username, how do we find their username? Anybody? Yes, sir. Okay, so you're going for email addresses, is that right? He's absolutely right. If, if you're trying to log into an email client, you can often use the email address. That said, if you're trying to log into, say, an RDP or something that's connected to Active Directory, sometimes the email works. How many of you have been into places where your internal username is different from your email address, right? That happens. So, so yeah, we'll get to that. Um, have you been in any one of these talks before? Or are you just showing off right now? Okay. Um, 
with email addresses, because a lot of people talk about that, find the email schema, go to LinkedIn, you can dump a bunch of email addresses. It works if you're going after the email directly, but if you're going after something else that requires a login, don't rely on it at first. If for whatever reason you can't find it, by all means, try it. But I don't recommend just spraying and praying at first. You know what I mean? So someone else said, go ahead. It's a VPN gateway, we'll get to it. It's sexy. I should say every picture that's up here is a picture that's actually been taken from an actual breach. No NDAs were violated because I don't sign NDAs and they don't know I have it, so good luck. All right, so with this in mind, uh, somebody said metadata. What do you mean by metadata? That was you. I know what metadata is. What, what, what metadata would be in a, uh, that would have a username? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. If you find Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, uh, PDFs, you can use things like Google Dorks, right? File type PDF and, and the domain. Anything that's served up from their website, you can pull down. If you look at the metadata for that, a lot of times the author field will have their internal username. It could have full name, it could have email as well. But a lot of them, especially if it's configured that way to have whoever the user is writing it, they'll have the internal username. Absolutely. Uh, a, a note of that is you can do Google Dorks, download a lot of things. Um, if you find that it's pointed to something else, go into that page and try to enumerate more things. A lot of times a site's own search bar will give you a lot of PDFs as well. If it has a, a common schema like, uh, you know, um, doc and a bunch of numbers, you can then use, you know, a, a wget or a for loop and download an entire store. If it has, if it's serving up on, on a, a WordPress site, you'll have an uploads folder, right? Try all these different things. It used to be you could go to docs.com and download a lot of that. Um, I don't think it's around anymore in the same way. Um, but you can do things like LinkedIn. A lot of people that work there, they'll, they'll present papers or, you know, slide share and things like that. Um, they'll put up their various different papers that you can download. If they work for the company, chances are they made it on a company uh, computer. Who knows? By all means, try it. Um, there's a couple other different ways. A lot of places, um, if you're trying to log in, a lot of times if you just read the help, uh, universities are no notorious about this. They'll say, hey, go read here and teach you how to get in. It will say, hey, use your, uh, use your username ID. It's in this format. I'm like, well, shit, thanks. That's great. That happened to this place. And, and I changed some things around, like Evil Corp, because that's funny. Um, but it actually had underneath, this is a Citrix login. So Citrix, remote, VPN, dot, what have you. Citrix is remote desktop through the browser, right? So I'm actually using the, the elite hacker tool right now, uh, Firefox. And um, I'm going to their citrix.domain.com and it pulls up and it says, hey, to log in, enter your USR number followed by at Evil Corp. And it was uh, five numbers after it. So now I just created a username list of user 000 through 9999 and now I've enumerated all of them. If, it's, if it is the email or if it's some sort of name based, it might be first initial last name, first name, dot last name, what have you. Um, we'll get to that in a second. I like your mentality though. Um, whatever the schema is, say, say it's, say it's a, a name based, right? Say it's first initial dot last name and that's their login schema. You can go into LinkedIn and pull down all the names. The problem with LinkedIn though is what? You got to have connections. So in order to see sometimes, sometimes, so just coming in raw, there, you're right, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. That's a very good point. Real quick, uh, and it says dump databases. Let me back up on that because that's absolutely true. If you can get an email list and their internal username is different from the email list, chances are the email has a full name. And so you can then create you know, schemas out of that. Uh, and it six said, uh, dump lists. Uh, the collections dump came out. If you wanted to download a couple terabytes worth of text, you can absolutely do that. Um, my two favorite lists, if you just need two for corporate, are LinkedIn and Ashley Madison. LinkedIn is obvious. That's gonna have a lot of names that are associated with the companies whenever they created it, right? Why do I like Ashley Madison aside from the idea that I can, you know, I don't know, Tinder, Tinder replaced Ashley Madison. But 
Exactly. The gentleman said you use your org email instead of your home email because for a lot of people, they only have two emails. The idea of a free email account or burning email account is foreign. So they have two. They have whatever their home email address is, whether it be their ISP or what have you. Their home email address is shared naturally with their spouse because they only have one, right? It's a family email address. And so if they want to hide something from their spouse, they use their second email, which is at work. You go through the Ashley Madison dump, you will find high level, C level in there. You'll find .gov, you'll find .mil, because these mother lovers are horny as fuck, but they're not thinking because they don't have blood in their brain right now. That said, it's a wonderful place for corporate email accounts. And with those, you can get names and then create it. But going back to uh, LinkedIn, real quick on, on going through to get names and then creating either emails out of it or internal usernames. Um, for free, if you come in, you're going to need to be connected to them. It typically within a second connection, right? In order to build up that level, it takes a lot. You run the risk of someone saying they don't know you and your account being banned, et cetera. Real quick pro tip on this, join, um, go in, get enough people, kind of sit for a little bit, but friend their HR or their recruiter. Two reasons. One, they automatically friend you back because they're all lying whores and they can do that. I don't mean to slut shame, I'm sorry. Um, but they are very, uh, 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 they absolutely love, you know, connecting with folks. The other thing is because they love connecting with folks, whoever they've hired and sits internal, they are connected with. Everybody here that has a LinkedIn, chances are you connected to the recruiter that hired you or uh, HR whenever you came in. That gives you second level to almost everybody. You can enumerate names from there. If you want to spend $100, $150, by all means, become a LinkedIn recruiter account or a sales account, and that will just give you all sorts of shit. And if you're going to make more money than 150, then by all means. You had a, you had a thing. No, you're just smiling. That's horrible. Don't smile there. This is bad. All right. Uh, I have not. Um, I know Troy Hunt does. Uh, he holds a lot of things to that. Will he give you information? Yeah. So now you're brute forcing Troy's stuff. Uh, that's just a dick move. All right. Hunter.io is excellent. Uh, Norseman says on, uh, on chat, Phil Wiley's supposed to be checking chat, but he's just grinning and looking at Twitter right now. Um, <clears throat> all right. So you got to go through all the chat because there's people online that care about you, Phil. This is for you, man. Cough, cough. Yeah. Go look at whatever EKG said. Or, yeah, 56 messages. They, they've been participating this entire time, and I haven't known. Pay attention, Norseman says. How about I read to you so that you can then tell everybody else? All right, go through there real quick. Um, here, though, they gave us the, the, the username. Okay, so I'm going to stop real quick. Did anybody in there say something interesting, or are you just going to ignore them all? We can wait. All right, so the question was, have I ever used USBs and just scattered them around? One, USBs cost money. That's like a buck a pop, right? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm over here hurting. Um, you can just kind of scatter USBs around. It doesn't really work too well for me because a lot of people don't really do that too much anymore. Two things that will help a USB drop, though. One is if you package it up and make it look like a free what have you with like a little pen and a notepad and a USB or what have you. Or the actual, well, you can do the actual package you even want. I, I like, I like recoding it with a vendor and making it look like a free gift and then going and handing that out. Yes. Yeah. So, so that's the other thing that I like to do is, is Tails is another hacker and, and, and he mentioned putting in a personal item. One favorite one that I like doing is putting, getting one of those really silly USBs, you know, like the one that had the Looney Tunes, what on it. And, and uh, putting some like naked pictures that you got from the amateur site, self-shot kind of stuff, right? Um, kissing it with your own lips because mine are very supple. And then doing a quick little spray of just a free little thing that you might find at Sephora, right? And then so, uh, and then saying, uh, you know, for your eyes only, uh, hope you get back, have fun on your business trip. And then going and putting that in the men's uh, restroom, side on the side, like it, it fell out. At that point, people's like, oh yeah, shit, we're gonna do this. And because they're not thinking the blood's drawn from their brain, they're gonna plug it right into the work here. So you can do it, but I recommend prepping it a little bit, not doing the whole Mr. Robot sprinkling around on the ground kind of thing. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. 
damn, they'll take care of it. So, so Wirefall said that, that he'll prep it to make it look like it's in our office mail. He'll go in from the outside saying, hey, I found this loss on the sidewalk. Could you take care of it? And because it's already uh, addressed the right person, it then gains the legitimacy of an inner office mail to go to it. So another good example of make it look legit and entice a person to put it in. Don't just sprinkle it around. If you're going to take the time to buy USBs and load it up with malware, yeah. There you go, yeah. Um, Rex said use different color Sharpies, uh, making it look like different people have, have gone, it gives it a little bit of a, of a what is that word, uh, providence? Yeah, legitimacy. Um, okay, so let's assume we have the username, or I've got a username list. Uh, we're gonna go with this one right here. So it was a username schema that was based off of numbers. These are really nice because you don't have to create uh, um, you know, names, uh, first initial, last name. One big thing on first initial, last name, if you go on LinkedIn, you pull those down, you can get known usernames. But by all means, get the top 1,000 surnames of American surnames, since we're in Texas, uh, Hispanic and Mexican and, and Latin surnames. Um, if you're in an area that has a lot of H1B Indian surnames, get a bunch of those on the end, and then make a for loop that puts the first uh, uh, letter of everything in front of that. You, Nobody knows how to use Perl anymore, Wirefall. Yeah, rewrite it in Python or Ruby for the hipsters. Uh, there are scripts that will help you do this. By all means, code it up yourself or share and share alike. It's absolutely right. Um, the ones, though, that are number-based are really easy. You just do the bottom number, iterate to the top number, and you have the entire username list. Okay, after username, we need passwords. How many passwords do we try per? Three. I heard three. That sounds like a random number. Anybody else? Anybody says 69, I'm going to back in them. As many as you'll let us. Uh, Commander says two passwords. All right. Why do we not want to necessarily use, say, 20 passwords? We'll lock out the account. Now, what if I just got screwed over by a collections agency and I want to cause a denial of service and I find something that's connected to Active Directory? say, you know, Citrix, and it's coming up right before Q4 when they have to file with the SEC, and I want to lock out all the accounts. Then I intentionally send 20 bad passwords, or shit, 100, to every single one and lock out their fucking accounts. That's cool, right? Pissed off the IT, but I locked his shit out too. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. You, you, you can absolutely do the whole Raptor thing and just keep hitting it until they turn off, right? Um, so I don't like lockouts myself. I prefer timeouts, you know, but you can still slow them down. That's a cool attack. Understand, what is your goal in all this? We're talking about getting money because we're going to hack in and get all the internal shit and get money. But if you just want to cause a denial of service, by all means, just spam it. You're looking at me like that, that's entirely fair. I said that she was looking at me. She said I was looking at her. She was not wrong. Let's assume we don't want to lock them out. So if we don't want to lock them out, how many do we try per? I heard two. I heard three. Uh, the, sh the short answer, well, the long answer is um, different places can have a different number of times, right? If you have a service that when you try when you try a password, it tells you wrong. You try it again, it tells you wrong, it tells you wrong again. If it tells you, hey, you're locked out, cool. Pick one account and methodically lock it out. And now you know how many go one less than that. You know how many that you can do, right? That person has to go reset their password, but who cares? That is absolutely not true at all places. Yeah. That's absolutely true. So init six makes a good point, and this, this point's gonna always matter. Just because it says something doesn't necessarily mean it's true, all right? Uh, I've learned not to trust the output of my tools. They all lie to you. Hey, yeah, Rainmaker, you shooting yourself in the head? What, what are you pointing at me? I did grow hair, I do that. Everybody thinks I'm bald with a beard. It doesn't make any sense. All right, so um, uh, you can try to methodically lock it out, but hey, let's be safe, and most of the most, lockdown places will lock you out after three uh, wrong. So let's go ahead, for the sake of this one, only try two. Now we're not trying to brute force any one account, 
maybe you are. Maybe you got the account of like, you know, the domain admin because he put that on his uh, resume and you're going to go after him. But right now, let's just try to get into a account, any account. We'll try two passwords. What's the first password we try? And I should say, hey, if you're experienced on this one, don't shout out the answer. Let's let the people that, that are kind of new at this right now. Um, there is no wrong answer for this as well. What's the first password, if you're new at this, what's the first password you'd try? Password, I heard just regular password. Any others? There's again, there's no wrong answer. Anybody in the chat? Phil, are you reading the chat? This is your place. Okay, I'm gonna read the chat. One, two, three, four, five, six, I heard winner 18, what have you, okay. So, yes, sir. Dang, son, you are wise. This nine-year-old over here articulated the first password that comes to your mind. Chances are it's the first password to come to someone else's mind. Holy shit. Damn, I'm going to be reading like meditations here in a bit. And I was like, crap. That's absolutely true. Yeah, by all means, what's the password you'd pick? And don't overthink it and just kind of do it. Company name, absolutely. So one note of the, of, I heard specifically password. And I heard one, two, three, four, five, six. That's really good if you're going after, say, web services, Spotify or, or what have you. But what's an issue with corporate passwords? Complexity requirements, yeah. A lot of them will say upper, lower, number, symbol, three out of four, minimum eight characters. Ooh. So that's great. Real quick aside, what was your name again? Diana. Diana said that she always gets a welcome, what was it? Whatever the year is, an exclamation mark. Um, you just told me your company's default password, so hopefully I don't know where you work. <laughs> I, I know that you're trying to, to uh, man, this thing's getting really hot. Hold on one second. <laughs> Are you okay? I didn't mean to scare you. We got similar glasses. Look at that. Yeah. I didn't mean to take, I told you I'm getting naked. That starts with the hair. Damn. Holy shit. Fucking hair is hot. Oh, I, don't pass that shit around. There are children here. That's back when I did nude. Uh, so, okay, so we were talking. I, 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 I've let myself go, all right, but. But I actually have a longer beard and whatnot. Um, uh, I don't know if y'all could hear that on the chat. Uh, she was she was exclaiming that she told me her password. Um, so it's very good that that you want to. You, okay, now you're looking at me funny. Okay, I'm gonna come over here. Uh, it's really good that that you know don't don't tell me your default password. But that being said, typically a, a, a introductory password to to many places is some form of welcome one, welcome one, two, three, the current year, what have you. If you can. Yeah, exactly. So if you can get the actual welcome password, chances are there's a lot of people that, that didn't change it by all means use that. Um, yeah, yeah, nobody take any pictures if, if, if you don't mind. Send like fake shit like they normally always do. Um, so uh, uh, let's see, what have you. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six won't work. Password won't work because we want to have complexity. Uh, upper, lower number symbol. With that in mind, what do we pick? That's a very good one. So we get ABC123, common patterns. What else? Do an acronym. So that's, this is very easy for you. Remember, it's a very good password for you to choose. Do you think a lot of people, again, we only have two chances here, right? And we want to at least get one. Now, absolutely, someone might do that. But let's start thinking of how would most people do it because we want to get a big chunk, okay? That's a very good one. So, and it's almost like you've been doing this before. So hold on. So I saw in here, for instance, password one with a capital P, the A changed to an at and a one. That is good. That's a good corporate password. The problem is what Wirefall said, what happens after 90 days? Passwords a lot of times get reset. So now the person's changed the password two. So if you try password one, you're only getting people that would choose that thing. And they've only been there for less than 90 days. We don't want to limit ourselves. So one thing that, that, uh, that I typically use is the current, and folks have said it, but it's the current month or the current season, really, because seasons change every 90 days. Current season, current year, and uh, um, capitalize the, uh, the first uh, letter. 
For the second one, if they're really secure, current season, current year, capitalize the first one and put an exclamation mark because that makes it secure. So long and short, there's no wrong answer. Try two. If you don't get any, chances are your tool's broke. It sounds like a personal problem. Look, like so much of hacking is, did my attack work? Was it blocked? Are my tools broken? I don't know, but I don't have a shell. Um, if it doesn't work, wait, I don't know, 24 hours is usually a good time and try again, right? Uh, but that's all of it. Okay. So what do we have uh, uh, going online? A lot of people, their password is Hunter2 or just a bunch of asterisks for those who have... That, that, that's, an, that's an internal joke. All I can see is asterisks because I, I can't see Hunter 2. Um, all right. You could, uh, uh, Init6 was talking about password dumps. There's something called password stuffing. Chances are if they have a password uh, that they've used somewhere else, you can see if they maybe have multiple dumps. And you can either use the exact same password or iterate off of that. That's good for targeted attacks. A cool thing about password dumps is that you can enumerate all of the domain you're going for and then sort by how many uh, passwords have been counted and you'll at the very least find culture maybe popular sports teams or local street addresses that they use or you'll find their default password and that will let you in as well all right so for this one i'm going to go ahead and just do spring or the current uh, season uh, current year etc um and uh, uh, we'll try that. But again, there's kind of really no wrong answer. Phil, you want to change because it didn't work again. I, I broke your shit. All right, there it goes. Okay, so you can see when I did this, it was 2016. Um, I tried a good handful, you know, less than 10,000 accounts. I'm using a tool right here called Burp Intruder for Burp Suite. There's a free community version. You can use Zap Proxy. Uh, there are some command line tools. Uh, you know, Hydra, you can use. I don't know, Python for loop if you want to. Um, one thing, uh, can you bring down the, uh, uh, the chat real quick? <clears throat> Using Intruder, an easy way, like, how do you know if the login was successful or not, right? It, it, we're talking black box, so you, you can't log in. You don't have a known good. Some things, absolutely. So sometimes if you log in, you'll get an okay request. But what happens if you get, Invalid login. That's still an okay. No, it's not a 404. It's still a 200. It's a valid machine that says you failed, suck, go kill yourself, right? Um, but it's a 200. The response is, is correct. Um, if it's a known app like OWA or what have you, there may be known goods in that. You can either find it. You can, if, if you're using a similar address and you have the, uh, you can set it up um, in your own lab, by all means, you can try to log in with your own account, get valid goods. Hydra's really good for that, has a lot of known goods. Things like SSH, Telnet will usually give a, a, a valid response. Well, yeah, um, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. So uh, uh, a lot of times in the response, you might get something that says, you know, bad password or what have you. And so you can write a script that pulls down all of uh, the resultant pages and then say anything that doesn't have that. And, and you can also do it in an in intruder, yes. Um, but you can find that known bad and, uh, and, and sort by anything that's not known bad. Chances are it's known good or an error, and you can at least have something narrow to search down. Yep, you can sort by length or, or, or byte comebacks, right? So uh, uh, whatever the, the response is, chances are an invalid response has a different size. The actual uh, um, HTML that comes back will be a different size than what a valid one is. So by all means, you can do that one. Uh, with this one here, what was really interesting was, for some reason with this Citrix account, uh, the very first place it went was the same no matter if it was good or bad. It was a redirect. And so all the byte length was the same, all the responses were the same, and so I couldn't tell what it was. So I realized that it, it sent me to a couple places, so I sorted by redirect, and anything that was one redirect would spit me right back out to the front page, and that was bad. Anything that was two redirects meant that it went through a couple systems before it gave me the actual internal Citrix. The big thing is try out different things. If we're talking black box, absolutely, if it's something known, do something known.
But a lot of times we're, we're going up against stuff we don't know, and you got to just kind of poke it with a stick and see how it kind of grunts. All right, so you'll see with this one, I got three accounts. So what should we do? Let's just fucking log in. I mean, maybe I'll go to the restroom real quick, but let's, uh, I can't contain myself. Let's log in. One note, uh, uh, if you have multi-factor authentication, and it's not working because it's not on there. Um, if you have multi-factor or they have multi-factor authentication, you can do a couple things. Most places don't do actual multi-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication is when you have to put in some sort of soft token, SMS message, what have you, some sort of additional thing that always changes besides uh, your password. Sometimes it's biometrics or whatever. Most places don't use multi-factor authentication. They use multi-step authentication. And what do I mean by that? Multi-factor is when in the login page, you have username, password, and then the multi-factor token you have to put in right then and there. Most places let you log in first and then do a second step to put in a second factor. You can still enumerate valid username and passwords for those multi-step. It still gives you good login, now put in the multi-factor, right? So you can take that and then go to the other logins and find one that doesn't have multi-factor authentication, right? All these places, they have single sign-on or what have you, filters all, there, there's gonna be some sort of orphan system that they forgot to turn off and is sucking up uh, electricity that you can still log into. So try it that way. If it is multi-factor, you can try things like race conditions, literally put in every single token real quick and maybe you'll get it, I don't know. Um, if it says, hey, send a push notification to a person, right? Send it, maybe the person will say yes, who knows? Around eight o'clock, oh fuck, I don't care, you know, whatever, right? By all means, try it. If you need to, and it tells you what number it's gonna send it to, like SMS, you can always hijack their SIM, right? That's completely illegal. But hey, do whatever the fuck you want. Or you can call them up and social engineer them out of the multi-factor authentication. The issue with multi-factor authentication is it slows you down. And so I like going to do easier stuff, but it can be gotten around, it just takes a lot more preparation. But this one didn't have multi-factor authentication, so I don't know why we're not we're talking about it because you know shit's easy. You just press enter five times and you get in. Okay. Go back, Phil. Jesus Christ. All right. No, that's too far. Uh, just right. Okay. So interesting thing with Citrix. So I should say we've logged in. Holy fuck, we logged in. We breached. Oh, this is great. Take off your pants, run around naked. I mean, this is, this is it. This is what we want to do, right? Don't, don't, I mean, hey, we're all adults except for that wise kid who's older than all of us. He's lived a couple times. So we've breached. Hallelujah. By all means, try out those passwords in different places, see what you can get into. If you can get into a straight remote desktop, by all means, do it. If you can go in through a VPN, by all means, do it. Um, Citrix, the way that this worked is it, it actually didn't have the start menu. It logs you into a Windows machine, but it didn't have a start menu. Now, all it did was give kind of an application there. All right, this sucks. Uh, I need to press start and then I need to type in to run, you know, CMD or if it's Windows me command, because that's a thing. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, how do we get, our goal at this point, our immediate goal is at least get a command prompt, PowerShell command, I don't know, the new terminal thing that's coming out or whatever it is, right? We need to get to some sort of shell or we can at least double click on something, right? But let's get to it, let's get to a terminal. How do we get to a terminal if a place doesn't have a start menu? These are called kiosk breakouts. Hold on, if you've actually done it, hold tight. Wirefall, I know that you're a seasoned hacker and I know you know the answer, okay? You're my mentor, everything I know you've known for 20 years, okay? So let's let the new people learn, okay? <laughs> All right, those who haven't done a, a kiosk breakout, what are some things that you might try to do? Rex, no, stop it. Commander, I'll backhand you. All right, yes, sir. This guy knows everything, but he's nine, and, and I think it's just precious. Yes, sir. So the question is, you've been presented with a kiosk that does not have a start button on it, but you need to be able to get terminal access. How do you get it? Yes, sir. Okay. 
Ooh. Yes. Yes. Easy mode. Okay, so, so this guy's like, fuck this noise. We're not breaking out of the kiosk. We're going to call up the IT guy himself and either con him or bribe him. That is awesome. He's like, just get enough money and the shit's yours, yo. That is, you're not wrong. You're absolutely not wrong. Some of social engineering, we already said that, you know, we want them to get them to do actions, right? By all means, get them to click on that shit for you. But let's say that we don't have that. Let's say that we have only this kind of access right here. What are some kiosk breakouts? One fun thing is, say, say the application's an internal web application and it's running on uh, Internet Explorer. What can you do with Internet Explorer? You can just type in the freaking full path name because Internet Explorer's Windows Explorer, right? It, it, it's whatever the fuck you want. So by all means, just type in, you know, see Windows System 32 CMD.exe, right? And, and, and you now have a, a terminal. What happens if they don't do that? What are some of the, some of the experienced folks and people online? Phil, I don't, rubber ducky. If you can shove a rubber ducky through your computer model and actually plug it into the Citrix account itself, well, actually, so to their point, rubber duckies are typically in-person physical devices. That said, a lot of times, I don't know if Citrix does this, sometimes VDI will do this, and sometimes uh, VMware will do this. You can what amounts to connect your own keyboard to it and you can run keyboard commands. So I wouldn't do a rubber ducky in that sense. I'd actually do my own keyboard. Um, but you can do things like Windows key will bring up a window, right? You know, let's get Windows R, uh, um, you know, control escape might bring up uh, someone's on. Right. Uh huh? Right? Yeah, you absolutely can. So HID stuff, again, we're, we're going through the internet here. So the only way that HID is going to get through the internet is there's some sort of functionality within the remote desktop that lets you access it. So by all means, yeah, control, delete, these are all really good keyboard commands that you could use to bring up some sort of a, a thing. Okay, so maybe we try keyboard commands and it works. Your rubber ducky is just a keyboard command. You're doing your standard, anything that can be done on keyboard, by all means try them. Uh, Windows R, uh, Control, Delete to bring up task lists, you know, various different things. What happens if keyboard commands don't work? What are some other things we do? Commander, yes sir. That's absolutely right. Commander said help dialog or file open dialog. Uh, if you press F1, even if it's a, a thick application, it's not, you know, it, it's not like uh, Internet Explorer. If you can go into the help or even uh, file print and, you know, things along those lines. Uh, what's that? Line bigger fonts? Yeah, absolutely. Accessibility. One thing that I like, so the, long and short, if you get to this point, there's an entire class of attacks called kiosk breakouts. It's fun to do whenever you go into a, uh, a hotel. Uh, and they've locked down their computer. By all means, practice and don't get caught because you'll get arrested. Um, one thing that I did here, and again, this is just one example, is, um, let's see, ma'am, you've got a Windows computer here. Would you do me a favor, and, and this is not social engineering, press the left shift key five times. One, two, three, four, five, six. Holy shit! Now click on that blue one right there that says disable this keyboard, right? Click on that. Fuck yeah, this is hot. Boom! We're into uh, uh, control panel settings, etc. And then from there, you can navigate to the Internet Explorer. I did sticky keys on the Citrix and it worked. And I was able to bring it up and, and that's all well and good. So I naturally went to Windows EXE. I typed in who am I? And, uh, uh, and yeah, and I blocked that out because... I don't need you knowing where I was at before because I'm still in there and they haven't found out, so lol. All right, so with that in mind, um, we have a command prompt. What's some of the first things that you might do if you're on a command prompt? Say what? Damn, fucking good. Give yourself administration status like it's a fucking walk in the park. I'm going to priv S because, yo, that's what I do. Jesus fucking Christ, dude. We'll get to that in a second. All right. Situational awareness, yes. What are some of the uh, common commands? They're actually programs, but common commands you can run to get various situational awareness. 
Task list is a very good one. See what's running on there. Netstat is really good. What is connected to me? I've got who am I up there, which tells you what user you are. Sometimes you don't know that going into it. Um, I will do things like uh, uh, IP config that will tell me what IP address I'm at and what, you know, what's the broadcast, you know, what's it? Say again. Set. Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. So you want to dump uh, environmental variables, see what's in there. That's absolutely right. Um, what's that? Tree. You can absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So anything that will give you information. Oh, Apex is talking about pizza. I need to get pizza. That sounds great. Um, the idea is, is take a moment and find out where you're at. A lot of the net commands are really good as well. Um, once I find out who I am and where I am, I might want to start kind of branching out a little bit. We talked about task lists to see what's uh, running. You can see what's installed. Uh, Netstat's a really cool one. It tells you what you're connected to. Um, if there's some back-end data stores, that's cool. Maybe someone else is connected to a uh, thing. W one thing to note that the very first time I went into this Citrix, um, just as an aside, I logged in and had about a minute or two access, and then I got kicked off. Blue team had found me already. What's blue team? No, not yet. Hold on. So the defenders had found me. I tried logging again, and they kicked me off in 30 seconds. I was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best intrusion analysts ever. And then I realized, yeah, it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and the way that Citrix and RDP works is that that was the user. I kicked off the user, and then when they logged in, they kicked me off. So I waited until after 5 and then logged in, and I could stay online. Right? So just kind of be situationally aware on that as well. Um, so Netstat, it, it could tell you, if Netstat tells you that something's logged in and you have an RDP session and someone else is logged in too, that's probably not a legitimate user. You might be, you know, doing a race with a hacker right next to you and you decide what you want to do. If you, if you test Bix for a living, maybe you tell your clients, uh, if you're going after turf warfare, you kick them off and try to close the way that you got in. So maybe changing the password of that person, who knows, right? If you change the password of that person and they need to reset it, you can do that for a night. So put some other level of persistence in. I'm not going to really cover persistence here. Um, persistence is just, hey, what happens if I get kicked off? And the way that I got in, um, uh, you either don't want to go in a second time because it, it'll set off alarms, right? Or maybe they fixed it and what have you. Persistence is just being able to get some sort of remote access in a different way that's continuing. There's a variety of ways to do that. If you have a little program that kicks your shell back, a really simple thing is putting it in the, uh, the startup uh, folder. That will, each time it starts up, log in, right? Um, you can have things that run on scheduled tasks, you can ping out repeatedly, et cetera. So look at persistence. Another thing is, uh, one thing that I'll do is I'll do like, say, who am I slash groups and find out what groups I am. Gentleman back there said, make myself administrator. Why would you want to be administrator? Who knows what administrator is? Yeah. So, Administrator typically has, so in Windows, you know, you got system, you got administrator, you got user level. Ideally, a place locks down what their users can do, especially in a Citrix environment, right? They say, you can only do these tiny little things and that's it. We call that least privileged model. Um, if you have administrator, you can do a lot more things, oftentimes accessing memory, oftentimes taking complete control of, of the computer and having it do things to you like on the network uh, level. Generally speaking, you're going to want to get as high a privilege as possible. You're going to want to get administrator. The way you get administrators is through a class of hacks called privilege escalations. How many of y'all work inside a corporation? Anytime a new privilege escalation uh, comes out, it's not patched. Like, oh, crap, there's a privest. There's a privest. And all of your managers are like, yeah, but they have to initially get access. So who the fuck cares about a privest? Now, here's a fun thing. If everybody in your company has uh, admit local administrator privileges, nobody cares about privest because if you already privest everybody. Right? So that's cool. You're over here like, we care about this. No, you don't. Everybody has local admin. You don't care. Nobody cares. You just give everything out. Jesus fucking Christ. I fucking hate this. It's too easy at this point. And I can't even do anything. I'm sitting here trying to bleed for my, my testing of the BICs and blue team. And just nobody's listening to me. My God, where were we? Um, look into things like privilege escalation. Uh, Commander has this really cool thing called an unquoted service path that he tells everybody about. Uh, it's an old, uh, uh, old Windows trick. Um, generally, the way that privilege escalations work is you find something that runs as system in some way, and you find some way that as a lower privilege user, you can 
alter a file or a state that would then get run by uh, uh, the higher privileged account, if you will. There's a lot of other different ways to do it. Um, you can look up uh, files and folders that are in typical system level areas. Uh, we were talking about unquoted service paths and things like that. Anything that would typically run at startup as system, if you can alter whatever it runs, you can have it run what you want, right? Um, if you list out all the programs that, that are installed, maybe one of those programs has a known vulnerability, uh, and because it wasn't exposed to the internet, they haven't patched it yet because it just works, and you can use it to privilege us. If you go to uh, um, exploitdb.com, that has a lot of publicly known exploits. If you can enumerate what's running on there, even if you're inside, enumerates what's running in there or uh, the libraries that are being used by those uh, programs, et cetera, and run that against known vulnerabilities in ExploitDB, it may tell you if, if something would work. Again, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel here. We're not going to custom craft it. If you can't move from here and you're able to enumerate what's going on and you want a zero day, by all means, go and find whatever that program is and try to bust it yourself. That's going to take a lot of skill, a lot of time and effort. Um, but absolutely, it, it's, it's able to be done. All right. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do crack map because out here in a second. Um, the, the, the gentleman that said, hey, just make yourself uh, administrator, there are a lot of really nice scripts. Uh, if you're able to pop a meterpreter shell and you're able to do uh, Metasploit modules, there's a lot of uh, good Python scripts, et cetera, out there, uh, PowerShell scripts that will look for common vulnerabilities without you knowing how to do it and will just give you. Uh, system, you know, like, like, like get priz or, or escalate, what is it, get system? Yeah, get system. By all means, run it, try it. Chances are, if you're doing something raw like that, though, it might trip an antivirus or an endpoint protection. So if you're in here, part of the what's around me is see what's actually installed, what's running. If it has endpoint protection, ideally our, our O scenario pulled that down, but if it has some sort of protection, hold tight the fact that you're in right now. I mean, at this point, we're using system tools. We're not using any malware. We start doing things that escalate privileges using some sort of malware, some sort of uh, 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 exploits against those vulnerabilities. Chances are endpoint protection might key off of that. So be very, very wary of that. Try it in your own lab. If you're inside, you know what's running on it. So run that on your own stuff, check to make sure it still works and then go back to it. Um, cool thing here though is it was running as admin. So that whole long-winded of what you may have to do, most places run as admin, don't worry about it. One thing that, uh, as admin, you can do a lot of different things. You can use the creds that you have right then and there, and you can go start hitting other systems, right? What's one of the very first things that you might hit in an Active Directory environment? I heard domain controller from Rex. So, you can absolutely use tools like crap Mac, Crack Map Exec and not Crap Mac. It's actually a very good tool. Um, you know, uh, 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 SMB Client, um, uh, SMB uh, Enum, and various different things to go look for file shares internally. A lot of those you can access as guests, meaning, you know, no credentials. By all means, use your credentials. One specific place that I always go to in an active directory environment is the domain controller itself, right? In a Windows Active Directory environment, the domain controls what runs Active Directory. It then administers all the accounts and all the computers, uh, groups, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. So the, you have two things that you can attack with even user level, the lowest level privs that you have, user level, that you can access on domain controllers right off the bat. The first one is, yes, Sysvol. It's a file share that you can log into with user creds. By all means, dump that down. Sysvol is going to have a lot of things in it. It's going to have scripts that's run, uh, uh, you know, various different things. It's going to have uh, group policy objects. Sysvol, that's Sierra, Yankee, Sierra, Victor, Oscar, Lima. Sysvol, system volume. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the group policy object, et cetera. What's really fun is the domain administrators, the people who administer the domain, and they control the domain with domain controllers. Um, uh, a lot of times they'll write little notes to themselves and store it in Sysvol because they don't think anybody else can read that. So I've seen entire chat logs with usernames and passwords in there that they pass to each other. It's almost like they're, they're, uh, they're, they're, it, it's literally their password wallet. It, it's a text document or whatever. They're like, hey, if you need all the passwords, they're right there in Sysvol because only we can get access to it. The administrators themselves don't realize how it works, right? Because they're not looking at it as an attacker. They're looking at it as an administrator. 
So by all means, look around there. A, a lot of tools like, um, uh, I think it's like GPP num or something along those lines. There's some postdoc stuff and uh, just some actual, uh, sorry, some uh, post modules in Metasploit, some regular modules in Metasploit. I, I want to say crap Mac exec might have some of these. There's a lot of scripts that will go and enumerate group policy objects and, and pull out some really cool stuff. I'll tell you in here in a bit some of the things they pull out. Do it yourself, though. It, it's literally a file share. Go control A and drag and drop into your computer or do SMB client turn off um, uh, echo and M get star, you know, just go to fucking town and download that shit. Go through it methodically by all means. Some things that you will find in group policy objects. The biggest thing that you want to look for is something called C password. C password is a way that you, that domain administrators could, could create a, a local administrative account on computers that accepted the GPO. Go and study all, uh, how it all works. But the way it works is high level group policy objects will apply to certain computers. You can enumerate that uh, too. Um, a lot of times if it's C password, chances are it applies to all computers, especially in small, medium sized uh, companies. Um, it could be targeted, what have you. C password was a way to uh, basically change the password to the local admin account. The thing is they encrypted it. So when you see it, C password equals, and it's going to be some gibberish. The problem is I said encrypted and not hashed. A hashing algorithm is what? A one-way function. You get a fingerprint, but you can't work backwards. I know algebra says, you know, two plus X equals three. So three minus two uh, means X equals one, right? In hashing, because of magical things like prime numbers that I can't fucking understand, I get nosebleeds from. If you get a hash, Ideally, you can't work backwards from it. You can crack the hash, meaning you try a variety of passwords against it to see if it matches up, but you can't really get it outward. But the problem with C password is it's encrypted. That means if you get the key, you can decrypt it. It's almost as strong, this is C password. C password is almost as strong as base64 encryption. That's for you, Anith. Um, <laughs> whenever I'm drunk, I always say encryption instead of encoding and vice versa. And apparently I say, uh, uh, rainbow tables instead of dictionary attacks because, you know, alcohol. Um, the problem with C password is it uses a single key that Microsoft uses everywhere and that key is known publicly. Yeah, seriously. When I talk about elite hacking, that shit's open, yo. C password is basically clear text. It, it, I mean, it absolutely is. So if you see C password, you now have uh, the local admin password, and you can get that with user creds. That's a way to privesk. If you can go out to group policy, pull it down, then you log in uh, or, or, or change your user or what have you, you now have local admin. Cool. Another thing that you can do with the domain controller is you can uh, talk to it uh, via LDAP. Um, you can actually pull down all of Active Directory through LDAP with user level creds. That's cool. If you do both, you can then find out where those GPPs are actually uh, applied to, and now you have very specific go to here. I've seen other things in GPO, including clear text credentials that, they, that some folks have created to log into various different what have you. Um, Metasploit and common things will absolutely have scripts for C password. It's not gonna have scripts for all these other things because they're custom created. How could they make scripts? By all means, go through all of that. A cool thing with going down and pulling down Active Directory and LDAP is a lot of times they'll tell you what's running on those systems. You might have entire groups called Windows XP. The following hosts are Windows XP, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that those hosts are alive. If anybody knows anything about asset awareness, you know it's absolute shit. So at some point they made a list, right? Um, if you're lucky, they're upgrading everything. And so they made a list of things that need to be upgraded but haven't been upgraded yet, right? By all means, seize the day. Um, you just do an NS lookup or try to ping it or what have you to see if you can connect to it. Uh, long and short, there's a variety of things to do. As a quick aside, if you happen to get inside access, you're able to get in through uh, guest Wi-Fi or you plug in a rogue asset when you, when you went in. You don't have user creds. If you do things like go to um, multifunction printers, a lot of them have been configured to do LDAP lookups on the domain control because if you ever go up to a printer and you type in somebody's name and, and email it to them, like a scan or whatever, and you don't put in the actual hard-coded email, either it has a locally saved email right there, which it probably does unless it's a really small place, or it does LDAP lookups to the domain controller. If it does LDAP lookups, it means it has to log into the domain controller. Chances are that multifunction printer has default credentials of admin, admin, or whatever, 
just do a Google search for, for the manual. You can log in and change the LDAP printer and change, uh, like, write down the address because that's the domain controller, but send it to you, open up a Netcat listener and have it authenticate to you, and it'll send username and password oftentimes in the clear, right? Those are now user credentials. Use that against LDAP yourself. A lot of times they said, hey, this is just a generic service account. Sometimes those are interactive. Sometimes they're domain admins. And so by hacking a printer, you take complete control of the entire place. That's happened before. One last thing is while you're here, from any user, you can do this by, by, by pulling down LDAP itself and being able to go through it. Um, but you can use things like net commands. If you do net users forward slash domain, it will give you all the usernames right there. Do net groups, it gives you all the groups, right? You can do net groups domain admins, and now you have high value targets. There are two ways, there are two kind of common goals if you're going after information uh, in an environment. You can go up and get domain admin or enterprise admin and then do whatever you want to, like an umbrella, or you can do what Wirefall says, just go after the fucking thing, right? Somebody here said, uh, uh, shares, I, I went to one area, uh, one company, um, got in through Wi-Fi, didn't have any creds, and did a spray looking for open shares, right? Their big thing was they had some sort of super secret intellectual property, some secret sauce that they couldn't get out because, oh, my God, they're special. It's in a fucking patent, but whatever. Um, but it was the process in which to, to create the whole thing that was super secret, right? And I tried. I saw a, a database there uh, that held all the information. I couldn't hack into it. I didn't really try, but it was locked down, right? Um, I ran Nessus open because they can't see me. Some bullshit. Um, but what happened was every single day they made a clear text backup on an open share. So I went to the share, pulled down the intellectual file. I don't need to hack into shit. They just left it there. So I took it. You don't need to get domain admin all the time. Waterfall says, in his infinite wisdom, and I'm being very sincere in that, go after the shit straight. You have a target, go after the target, right? But in this case, let's go for domain admin because we can't go for target. Maybe we don't know where it is. Or maybe we want to get control of SCCM and seed every place with ransomware because we want to get paid. Yes. That sounds fun, locking that shit down. They'll give us stuff, especially if it's a hospital because people might die. And if people die, they'll give you money. It's great. Okay, so we have local admin on this. Uh, we tried a couple things, we enumerated it, um, but what are some things that we can do local? Right here I'm running uh, Invoke Mimikatz. Who knows what Mimikatz is? It is precious. Uh, cat. Anybody online know what Mimi Cat is? Phil, you got one. He, he got a number. Read it. Read it. What, what do you say? I know Tinker. No, you don't. <laughs> oh, no, no. You, you know. I thought you said you, you like biblically knew me. I was like, Jesus Christ. All right. Well, if you know it, say it. We're all like everybody in the freaking rooms like looking at this. We see ha ha from Jamie Castile. What else? Phil, read that shit. It might have already. Service accounts don't always rotate passwords. That's absolutely correct. Kiwi. Yeah, Kiwi is a, a, a Mimikatz module for an interpreter. Um, so Mimikatz will do a shit ton of things, and Gentle Kiwi is going to kill me because I'm going to go over it real quick. Uh, in machines older than Windows 8, so Windows 7 and prior, uh, it will go after LSAS and dump clear text creds. He's able to get it through a lot of stuff nowadays anyways, but you can run and get clear text credentials of people that have logged in. Um, you can pull out local admin hashes, and I'll get to that in a second. You can get a lot of other different hashes, and basically just a shit ton of creds. It plays in memory. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, one thing to note, I, I pull it down, and I got the local administrator hash. This place didn't have C password, but it did have a local hash. That hash is what kind of hash? Anybody know what kind of, what's that? Yeah, NTLM hash. Um, Holy shit, I don't know what the most recent Hashcat uh, shit was. I think, look, an eight-character password, upper, lower, number, and symbol. So the way that we crack a hash is we try passwords against the hash. Um, and so we take a password, run it through the NTLM algorithm, and then we compare the output uh, uh, to see if, the, if it matches. If it matches the same password, if it doesn't, we try something different. Um, I... I, I I put out some freaking uh, uh, benchmarks recently, both on um, the NVIDIA GTX 1080 Ti, but also on like AWS's like cluster. Look, you can build a, a kick-ass uh, hacking rig for, I don't know, five, $10,000, or you can rent it off of AWS for 
$25 an hour or $12 an hour if you're doing spot checking, et cetera. Uh, if you want something cracked in a heartbeat and you're willing to do sex for it, go to Knit6 and uh, he will crack anything for blue. It's awesome. Crack blue. Uh, and by blue, I mean blue jobs. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, the white stuff, I don't know. Are, are you are you good on that? Huh? You'll, you'll do it for Coke? Oh, shit. Well, then drugs and sex. Hey, good man. All right. Sounds good. Um, long and short, so an eight character password. Let's talk about key space. When I say key space, I mean possible number of combinations. So an eight character password that has upper, lower number and symbol. Let's assume that they made it perfectly random. If, if they did something like spring 2018 or they did something like a, a name followed by a number, we're going to crack that instantly. We're going to use dictionary attacks with rules, et cetera. But let's do a straight brute force where we try like A, B, 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 A, A, C, whatever, right? You're absolutely right. So let's put math to that. Okay. So it's Diana, right? Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to, I swear I'm just going to be me this time, okay? Okay. I don't, don't. For those of you online, Diana said don't pull anything else off or out or some shit. Ah, oh, fuck my zippers down. All right, it wasn't. I just did that motion for you. I like how you're leaning in and we're going to do this. Okay, so eight character passwords. Let's just worry about one character. How many possibilities for one character? 26, why? 26 letters in the alphabet. Those are lowercase letters, so how many uppercase letters? Holy fuck. We gotta double that shit, yeah, that's right. So now we got 52, okay. but we also have numbers. Okay, so 52 plus what? No, 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 just a single number. Oh. We're using base 10, so how many fingers you got? 10. Nine plus zero okay. is ten. Is ten okay? That's right. Zero is zero is a number. No, 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 no. Zero is a number. Well, zero is a representation and a character that we can use. All right. So we got fifty-two plus ten. That's sixty-two. We can also use special characters, symbols. Now, fuck everybody talking about Unicode and fucking emojis. Nobody does that shit. So don't worry about it. So we're just going to look at a United States keyboard. If you're hacking another place, look at their keyboard. But for right now, we're, we're in Texas, so we're going to hack Texas shit. If you count out how many different special characters, it roughly comes to like, oh, no, not bits. We're just talking about characters. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. So ask you, but what, let's not worry about that shit. Just what, people are bashing on a keyboard, and it's like you're thinking too hard. All right, roughly 33, including the space bar. So we're going to call it. 95 characters in a single uh, digit. So if I had a one character password, what's the key space? 95. Holy fuck, you're right. <laughs> God damn, you spooked me. Well, what if I have a two character password? That's interesting. So she said, what, what does it go to? The second one, 94. And what she's talking about, I forgot the math term, if anybody wants to tell me, factoring, I think it's right. Sorry. Yeah, factorial, thank you. So if you go up on um, the, the door locks that have the push buttons on it, you can, maybe they have five buttons on it, right? Every time you push a button, it can't be pushed again. So those door locks, you can't do one, 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 one because it's already been depressed. And so what happens is you have five options at first, and then you only have four, and then you have three, and then two and one, and we're not even talking about pressing two at the same time, et cetera. So if we're factorializing, by all means, we subtract one. But I can do A as the first character and A as the second character, so nothing's changed. I mean, it could, but right now we're literally going to try everything. I'm going to try uppercase A, lowercase A, and everything, because we have established that we have 95 options on the first one. Holy fuck, math. Jesus. All right, so 95 plus 95 times 95, because it's A, 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 B, A, C, et cetera, okay? Oh, my Jesus Christ. You just had a brain hemorrhage and started bleeding through your nose. I'm going to throw something else at you. So that's 9, 95 to the second. If we have an 8-character password, it's 95 to the 8th. So 95 times 95 times 95, 8 times, right? How many, who is this? This is Matt? Math. All right, math. Uh, <laughs> since your name's math, I'm going to hope you know it. What, what's 95 to the 8th? Oh, come on, it's like, I don't know what, like six quadrillion? Yeah, it's, it, it, 
Somebody's got a cal. Yeah, our math teacher said we never carry calculators everywhere in our pockets. Fuck you, Mrs. Uh, Hewitt. I got a fucking calculator in my phone. Yeah, yeah, do, do the uppercase. You got, you got to turn it sideways to get all the super secret stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Turn it sideways and you get the secret hacking tools in your camera. Yeah, yeah, look at this, look at it. Holy shit, I didn't even fucking know you could do that, could you? Jesus Christ. All right. Yeah, find out. Anyways, long story short, it's a couple quadrillion. Okay, with NTLM, and I don't know, last we were looking at was like, like 1.5 trillion guesses per second. Did you hear that? Trillion guesses per second. We can go through whatever it is. What was the number? Six? Six a lot. That is, that is six quadrillion. So you have thousand, million, billion, trillion, quadrillion. Right? Holy fuck, it's a lot. So you go through six quadrillion, we can exhaust the entire key space in what, in it? Yeah. I think with, with, with everything, I think the entire, yeah, yeah, yeah. So even that, the, the typical thing to go through the entire key space is about two and a half hours right now for an eight character password. Um, yeah, on average, because of the nature of brute forcing, you get that in half the time. But if you're doing things like, like rules and dictionaries, it's going to be instantaneous. <clears throat> yeah, Markov chains. There's ways to optimize this as well. But doing like raw, like the nastiest brute force, Two and a half hours. A nine-character password brings you up to about four days. Going through the entire key space. It doesn't really matter how random it is, right? So that's kind of cool. I'd go into things like password length. Cool thing about, uh, you know, what happens if we did five words, all lowercase, Diana, all lowercase. So if, how, many, how many lowercase letters are there in the 26? So five words minimum, four uh, uh, characters long. So that's 20. So it's going to be 26 to the 20th. How much is that? 26 to the 20th. We have less of an individual key space, but longer length. Yeah. An even bigger number. We had to do like each of the 28th. If you do a five-word pass phrase without any special characters, just raw character strength, it massively blows out an eight-character password, upper, upper lower number symbol, perfect randomness. Even if you factor into common English words and you only have five, I don't know, there's something like, what, 7,000, 10,000 to the fifth power? It's still better. We have taught our users to create passwords that are hard for them to remember and easy for computers to crack. Instead of past phrases that are easy for them to remember but hard for computers to crack. All right, that's enough of this. What's really cool about this NTLM hash is I don't need to crack it. I can pass it. So passing the hash means I literally just use it to log into it using the hash itself as the password. Now, a lot of places when they create computers, think of your workstation. They're not going to install a workstation each time. They're going to get an image and plant it on there. A lot of places will create one image. They call it like a golden image. And they set their password and they stamp that every single place. That means that every single place has the same exact password on the local admin. You're over here doing super uh, secret shit, you know, making sure that, you're, that nobody can see because it's only you, right? But all your IT folks can come in uh, on the back end and see all the nasty shit you're doing. You're leaving already? It was the math. It was the math. Thank you, though. No, absolutely. Diana, I'm sorry. I would have. Thank you for your help, though. I'll put it back on. I will be whatever you want me to be. I can do that. I have no sense of self. I can be your dream. Just tell me what it is, all right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. She wanted a man with hair. I can be a man with hair. All right, what were we talking about? Because I know the fucking derailed me. She's, she's really pretty. Yeah, golden images. She is a golden image, isn't she? Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so the idea is if you get one password locally, you can get in everywhere. Something like LAPS or, or, or some super secret, like, third-party stuff will, uh, will change all that around. But by all means, use it. That, that, that can, at this point, you don't even need domain admin. Chances are you can just get everywhere. What I ended up doing, though, was, uh, um, yeah, blood draining from the brain. Thank you, Norseman. You know what I'm talking about. I was able then to log in. I'm logging as that local admin, uh, uh, that local admin account as well. Again, that's not domain admin. It's local admin. Um, ran uh, Mimikatz, got onto the CEO's 
uh, 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 laptop because it had the back door, dumped out his clear text password. The cool thing with systems, uh, Windows 7 and prior, and even some different weird things that Windows is doing right now, I just talked to Jindal Kiwi, is it will dump your clear text password, right? It doesn't matter how, how perfectly random it is. There it is. All right. Went and did this to a domain admin's account. Now, domain admins can do everything. The way domain admins work is whenever they touch a computer, really anything, but, but specifically on domain admins at this point, they leave down magic fairy dust called tokens, right? Any user does this, but we only care about domain admins. You can impersonate a token if you have local admin access and become that person and be able to issue commands as that person, right? You can impersonate that token. Um, because of the, the, the way that this works, just kind of how, how Windows goes, um, domain admin accounts, anytime they remote log into a place, they leave those tokens behind. Those tokens don't disappear until the machine has been turned off and turned back on. And in the cult of uptime, that means never. And so you go into one of these really old systems that's mission critical, oh my God. Mission critical means it can be knocked over really easily. That doesn't make sense. If it's mission critical, harden that shit. No, that means we can't touch it. Because what happens if we accidentally match it? It's better if you knock it over right now and fix the shit than someone knocks it over at a critical time. I digress. But because there's tokens in there, we can become the domain admin. If there wasn't a token, I went into a user account. So, so here's the thing. Um, if you are a CISO and you're logging into your laptop with domain admin credentials because of fucking hubris, and I fish you and I immediately get domain admin, that's some stupid shit. The only person who should be domain admins are fucking domain admins. And they should only log in whenever they're doing stuff with a fucking domain controller. They should log into their account with domain admins, create a separate account. Least access, least privilege model, right? These guys did it right. They had a separate user for the domain admins to do their day-to-day, -day, and then they had a separate account. I got his user password, but that didn't really get me anything beyond what I'd already had. Turned out, though, he used the same password for his domain admin account. So he has two separate accounts that share passwords. Why the fuck would you do that? But he did. Okay, well, at this point, we're domain admin. Now, this is an actual picture of a remote login to a domain controller. Here's the fun thing. When I took this picture, I didn't know how to do this. I knew how to create domain admins and do all the stuff with PowerShell and command, but I had never actually done it with a GUI. Every time I enter into a freaking uh, restaurant, I come in through the kitchen. I can't find the front door, all right? I learned computers backwards. I learned how to go in through, you know, terminal access back. I literally had to call up an associate of mine that was a former... Uh, uh, systems admin said, I need to take a pretty picture because nobody cares about terminal output. I need to take a pretty picture. How do I do this the, the correct way? And he walked me through because apparently Windows is, is uh, you know, GUI oriented. PowerShell's changing some of that around in your terminal, et cetera. So I created a, uh, an admin. Now, here's the thing. At this point, I'm domain admin. I can do anything I want. I'm creating another domain admin for shits and giggles. I just want to see if I can spook them. So I created a, uh, an account. They, they had USR for the users and ADM. A lot of times you'll find common schema that will help you out, right? I created ADM 31337. Why did I do that? Because I'm a cheeky son of a bitch. That's right. All right, cool. Did that. Have fun. You don't need to do that. That's just God begetting God. It's just an example. Um, okay, so what do we do now? We can do whatever the fuck we want. Uh, you, sir, you're bald. What would you do? Quit laughing, you're bald too. Bunch of white bald men in here. You, you got the keys to the kingdom. Of this, I mean, it could be any kingdom you want. You want to go into the accounting system. Why do you want to get, go into the accounting systems? Is money in the accounting system itself? It's not, I mean, that's, that's records of money. Payroll records. But maybe you'll, you'll go drain their accounts. I'm going to assume that. What do, you, what do you want to do, man? The, uh, you, the world's your burrito. What do you want to do? You're still looking for information. You went in sight unseen to see how much access you can get without a goal or care in the world, and now you're going to look for information? You dumped uh, LDAP before. You know the place. You've done your OSINT and your recon. You're literally stumbling around. You're like, well, shit, I got it. So now what the fuck? That's, that, that right there is, and you got to understand, like, like different ideas. Sometimes people are just curious and want to see what they can do. 
Sometimes you break into buildings or climb on the roofs just to see if you can. It doesn't mean you're a criminal. It doesn't mean you should have gone to juvie. It doesn't mean that now you have a felony record and you can't get a, a decent job. I tried to turn around. I tried to be valid, but now I have to frick. It's either hacking, selling drugs, or sex work, and there's nothing wrong with any of those. So fuck all y'all. Yeah, you can go after Linux systems if you want to. Some of them are okay. Look, look. So all of these are going. This, this is this is great. That is not wrong. That is right. All right. So we have a lot of people going after IP, but very succinctly, you'd go after all the information and sell that shit, because we're doing this for what? Money. Great. I'd get a hold of SCCM and seed everything with ransomware because that gets me money. I might go after accounts because that gets me money. Or I might destroy everything because my purpose is to destroy, right? By all means. Or I'm a fucking voyeur. I just want to look at everybody through their webcams. All right, so you got a sticker on your webcam right here. How many people have stickers on, on their on their uh, laptops? Everybody. Oh, look at all these guys, privacy freaks. How many of you have it on your other computer? Oh, fuck you. No, you don't. You've got it only on one side. So you're over here sitting on the pot in the morning, and they can't take pictures of you, but your husband's getting pictures of him being sent all over the Internet. That's good uh, operational security right there. Now that I know you're free, um, giggity. So, hey, if you go into a computer and you enumerate how many webcams are and it says two, I'm telling you, back the fuck out. You don't want to see the CEO on the shitter. That is just disgusting. You're a workaholic. All right, so, hey, everybody's chatting online. Phil Wiley left. I don't know where the fuck he is. All right, so I took the passwords. I can go in. Yeah, fucking, it's all unlocked. You don't want to see naked pictures of him, I'm telling you. It's not what you think. All right, so. If, if I, oh, Jesus fucking Christ. All right, all right, hold on. Phil, we, we were talking about you behind your back. We started passing around nudes. All right, so when you're in the domain controller, you can dump ntds.dit and get everybody's uh, hash from there. You can crack those hashes, pass them, et cetera. If you're domain admin, you already have full control there, but a lot of people have third-party cloud applications or their own bank accounts, et cetera, and a lot of times they share those passwords or it's active directly connected, and so you can then basically pivot at that point. Yeah, you can do persistence. You can get golden ticket with that. What's really, so golden ticket's a way uh, to get persistence within an active directory environment. There are ways to completely do a, a what is it, reforest or rebuild the force, what have you, um, and completely shut everything down and bring it all the back up a la Jurassic Park, right? In order to really do that, you got to do it a couple times in order to get rid of golden tickets. Coolest thing, though, you download ntds.dit. Um, you can do uh, password history within that. A lot of times, uh, I had this one uh, uh, company that I hacked into, got everything, right? They did a complete rebuild, kicked me out, uh, but still had remote login. They had everybody reset their passwords. Well, I had ntds.dit, so I had their previous passwords, at least the ones I cracked. One of them had, I don't know, like, um, you know, Go Cowboys 19. I tried it. It didn't work. So I tried Go Cowboys 20. Oh, I got in. Uh, so even though, you know, think about the technical means of persistence, but also think about psychological means of persistence. People are still going to get in the same way, right? Okay. So with this in mind, I'm going to go into uh, uh, Office 365, and I want to look at emails because I don't fucking care. I'm bored. Um, Cool thing is, Office 365 has multi-factor authentication. This place had, in, had implemented multi-factor authentication on their, o, or, sorry, their uh, Office 365. The thing was, though, this is the CEO's, by the way. The CEO hadn't set up his multi-factor authentication yet. He still connected internally through Outlook. He didn't go and use the web app. And so when I got in, it said, hey, you want to set up multi-factor authentication? I said, yeah, I do. And so I set it up, and now I have multi-factor authentication. The CEO doesn't, so fuck you. All right, real quick, let's say that I want to go after the CEO. The whole point of me hacking this corporation was to go after one person who's in there, and I'm using it to pivot into his personal life because I'm wrong like that, but he has a shit ton of money, and that's what we're going to do. 
Okay. So where do people store their, their password? What, what's, the most, what's the most favorite password manager out there? All right. So, well, yeah. So, so I heard a couple of things. Yeah, LastPass and, and, and one password are like online stuff. KeyPass, if you're a nerd. Um, uh, people talk about Excel spreadsheets, uh, uh, text documents, Word documents stored locally. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Uh, yeah, OneNote, SharePoint, whatever, you know, whatever kind of thing. Gmail. So uh, if you're General Petraeus, you store that shit in drafts, right? You know, because nobody can see drafts. It's right there, but nobody can see it. Um, uh, some people said post-it notes or that it's written down. And a lot of people foo-foo that. If you're in a corporate environment, that's stupid, right? Everybody can see it. But if you're at home, or even at your keyboard, if you're at home, though, and you write that shit down, if someone has access to it, they're literally watching you sleep. So you got other issues, right? You can't hack a physically written down notepad. So worry about your threat scenario. Who's your threat actor you're protecting against, right? If you're worried about people hacking in through, then write down a password. Hey, you leaving? Good job, dude. See you. Yeah, get you. All right. So that, that's kind of cool thing. One thing that, that Init6 has been yelling out since the beginning, but I was trying to lead up to it logically, was that yes, people use their drafts to store passwords, but they also use notes in Outlook. I hacked a financial institution, money, and they do shit on AS400s. I don't know what the fuck to do with an AS400. Nobody does. So I went into the person who, who was a system admin of AS400 because it was in the groups and I enumerated that with LDAP, right? And went into, their, uh, pa went, went into their Outlook, went into notes, and they had the AS400 password written there in clear text. I hacked a bank where the vice president of IT, think CISO at this point, right? Vice president of, of IT and, and security. They had all of the security uh, admin passwords in notes. They had Palo Alto, Q Radar, all that stuff. So at this point now I can hack them and go and turn that shit off. I went into Palo Alto logging in as admin and found out where all the other computers were because it has great asset awareness and I used it to pivot and hide what I was doing, right? Um, you'll get social security numbers of kids. You'll get bank account information. You get everything in there. Everybody stores it on, the, on their corporate one because they think it's more secure than their home one, not realizing that everybody and their dog can see it. The, the, the corporate computers are the exact antithesis of privacy. All right, Phil, is anything going on? I see 26. Phil, you're behind. Delete my notes. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, we have. All right, let's go to the next one. Okay, so a really cool thing was I wanted to go after finances. So this is a CFO. So a lot of information is stored in a uh, uh, box or Dropbox or OneDrive. A lot of those are offsite cloud, right? And it requires multi-factor authentication unless you sync it with your folders in your own computer. I have full access to the computer. It looks just like a folder to me. So here I am in the CFOs. I see accounting, acquisitions, auditor, board of directors, financials, everything. I've got real books. I've got cookbooks. I got whatever I need in there. And that bypasses multi-factor authentication. It just looks like a folder to me. I had another slide up here of a very pretty lady that I took a picture of her through her webcam, and we had that whole discussion, um, but that's not appropriate. So with that in mind, we started from the outside. We breached. We did actions. We did lateral movement, privacy, persistence. We did actions on target. We took them down. Plus, we got golden tickets, dumped in TDS. They can bring in Mandiant and full teams of DFIR, and they can't keep us out. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, you absolutely could. So the question was, if you get in uh, and you check local accounts, so local accounts are rarely locked out because, I mean, how are you going to reset it kind of thing. You can check the lockout policy per user, whether it's local account or domain account. And the question was, if you come across a high privilege account that cannot be locked out, would you try just brute forcing it? Generally, my answer is no. You absolutely can. There's nothing wrong with that. But understand that anytime that you do 
online attacks of brute force. Online means I'm going against the service and trying to log in over and over again versus offline attacks, which is us stealing a hash on our own computer. You do offline attacks, track it to your heart's content because it's your own shit. You do online, it's going to generate a failed login attempt, right? Um, we didn't really talk too much about this, but this brings up a really good point. We talked a lot about the actual hacks itself of how to get to different places, but chances are that they're going to have some sort of defense. If you're going after the big targets, they're going to have teams of active defenders, and those fuckers are more skilled hackers than, than I can even think of, right? So if you're going to do a brute force internally on that kind of thing, chances are you're going to generate enough noise that they're going to notice that you're there. There's really two ways to kind of approach hacking when you're going up against defenders. Low and slow, I'm going to exfil through DNS lookups and I see uh, our ping shit, right? Or really fucking fast, okay? My background's the Marine Corps. I'm not used to being quiet, I'm used to kicking in the door and running over shit with a giant truck, right? So when I think of exfil and hacks, I like to think of the Sony hack. How did they exfil? I mean, how many gigs did they exfil for one? It was like hundreds of gigs. I can't remember. It was a shit ton of data. How did they exfil it? Did they go through DNS? Did they leak it through different things? How did they exfil it? They went right. You're absolutely right. They spun up BitTorrent servers on the goddamn shit and BitTorrented that shit out, which was painfully ironic because it's like, we're going to steal all your shit by torrenting. And that's like, you know, the movie industry's like biggest nightmare. I was just like, Peace de resistance. It was awesome. Just a little bit of poetry in it. But they went so fast, their blue team went, oh, shit, and they couldn't do anything, right? One way or another, it's fine. So, yes, you can brute force it. If I was going to brute force it, what I might end up doing is going back outside. Nothing wrong with going back outside to some sort of web application that was connected to Active Directory and try to hit it with the potential idea that maybe they don't bring in WAF logs but they're at least going to be able to look at Windows events. Windows events is one of the, the most primitive primary things that can give some sort of level of intrusion detection even before you start building on other things. So I generally stay the fuck away from brute forcing internally. But if they haven't seen you then and you can brute force real quick, I mean, if nothing else has worked, why not? Go for it. What's the worst they can do? Kick you out, burn it, you hop an IP, wait two weeks and try again, right? All right, any questions uh, online? Nope, they're all happy. No, they logged off. Fucking time is it? Jesus fucking Christ. My God. All right, no, no questions online. Still here. Yeah, see, Night Nightwatch. Nightwatch, my 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 bud. I don't know what Nightwatch's gender is, whether it's binary or NB, but uh, that's my person, yo. So snore. Fuck you, Norse man. All right. Well, nothing else going on. Anybody else have any other questions? Anybody want to add insight? Those of you that are experienced hackers. Do you have a favorite uh, tip uh, uh, that you want to kick to everybody else here? This is Pwn School. We're, we're about teaching folks. Oh, okay. So this is a question of what do I do? I try to get in and get money. And so generally, if I can do it myself, that means I keep all the money. So for me personally, I like being as broad scope as possible because I have found that the more doors, I, uh, uh, handles that I jiggle, one is likely to open, okay? There are some people that really specialize and they can get in that one thing. And if it doesn't work, chances are they can find more than me in that one area. And if you're hyper-specialized, you know, maybe you're like IoT firmware reverse engineer goddess, right? And there's plenty of IoT exposed to the internet. That's how you get in, it gets in every single time. Nothing wrong with that. I've seen too many people specialize into obsolescence though. And so for me, I like to be a generalist as it relates to breaking in, um, because if I can't get in one place, there's something else that's open. That's me personally. Generally speaking, if I can't get in, I'll bring in another specialist or something and add to my crew. It means I lose money, but hey, 60% of something's better than 100% of nothing, right? Does that help you? Did that answer your question? I'm not seeing anything. I can't see anything. Phil, what do you say? Nothing? Do they hear me? How do you know they hear me? Is that what they, did they say? They heard, they could hear me. They didn't say anything. You just know. Yeah, I know that. That was those fucking Norsemen. Yeah, fuck you. Whoever said move on. Just fucking okay. Chris can hear. I care about Chris. I don't care about anybody else. All right. Yes, sir. Another question. Okay. So so the question was, 
once I've gotten a beachhead and I've done some migration, some lat movement, what's the minimum number of persistence that I have? Uh, I don't fucking know. Generally speaking, I'll get one, two, or three different levels of persistence in my immediate beachhead. If I can find other places, I'll kick it out to two or three different command and controls, right? That's just a good number. It literally is, do I think they're watching me? How quickly does it seem that I can move through it, right? Uh, if they're kicking me out a lot, then I'm going to get in and get persistence to go low and slow for a long time and slowly seed uh, my way through and get persistence. If I'm going through and doing crack map exec and spraying the entire, you know, wilderness across every switch and router and they're not stopping me, then, you know, I might get, uh, I might try to move a lot faster and not worry so much about persistence. It's a judgment call based off the environment that you're in. I like at least having two methods of persistence if I'm going to do it, pointed out to two different command and controls. Does that make sense? But that's just because that's what I hold in my mind. Uh, if you want to do like automated, terraformed, holy shit, spin up 200 C2s with however many much, and you got a backer that's paying you front money, and because you're going to give him a cut, and you're going to take down an entire freaking organization, by all means. But uh, for me, two or two, maybe three. Okay. Okay, any other questions? So, so init six asks the question of, uh, can you do actions on one target to trigger some sort of action somewhere else to gain money? Look, monetization is monetization. We're all here to make money, right? So if you can make money by taking it down with IP and selling it, if you can do money that you think will have a secondary thing, typically the further away, the more steps you have to monetization, the more likely it's going to fail. So if you're all watching like Black Hat and you're going to like kill an entire village in order to bring up the price of some random stock, holy fuck, you're overthinking it. Literally just ask them for money and they'll give it to you. Um, if you think that you can hack and you can con somebody into doing what's called a pen test where they have you hack for it and they pay you money for it, cool. You can con however you want to con, get your money however you want to money. Um, my suggestion is the closer it is to raw cash, the quicker, but the less steps is better. Uh, but monetize however you want to monetize, by all means. So, I mean, there, there's pros and cons against everything. The question was, if you go more direct with less steps, don't you increase uh, your ability to uh, get caught, if you will? Don't you increase your risk to get caught? Sometimes, yes. I'll give you an example, though. If I'm having somebody route money to me, that's direct. I didn't even hack shit. I just said route money, right? They route money to one account. I then hop it to a, another account, another account, another account, at least four or five accounts. Um, cross state lines and then hop overseas. Yes, they can catch me, but it takes minimum 24 hours for each request. I bought myself a week just by doing something real quick. I can have mules go into different ATMs, draw up money. I'm scot free, right? So pro and con for everything. You either front load the proxy through your immediate steps and break up continuity, break up context, or you do it afterwards. You always break up context, whether it's something as simple as reconning, like for instance, we're talking about fast recon. You can go low and slow and be quiet so they don't detect recon, or you can pull out fricking uh, mass scan and, and, and fricking, you know, uh, mod deuce that shit 50 cal style, spray everything. They go, block that IP, and you've burned it and moved on, right? Hold on one second. Did that answer your question, Annette? Did you have any follow-up questions? Go ahead, please. Huh? Does compliant mean that you're beating them up and they're not giving you the password? They're not PCI compliant. That, that's uh, that's politically correct introspective. Okay. Huh? Okay. Yeah. You're saying what? What if? Okay. Uh huh. Okay. So so the question was. If you come across a database randomly and find that they're not PCI compliant, whatever the fuck that means, uh, and they're storing uh, credit, I don't need to know, it doesn't matter. Uh, they have credit cards in there unencrypted randomly. This is a very specific question. Where do you work? What, what databases have you been looking to? Look, look, uh, a, a credit card is a credit card. And if you have security uh, and you have, you know, their address, et cetera, it's all CV, yeah, the CVC. Um, 
that everything's together, you can use it to, I don't know, buy shit with a credit card. So you can do one of two things. You can either use it yourself and, I don't know, buy an RV because you like traveling. Um, uh, or you can bundle it up and go on to credit dump sites. You can either go on the dark net, which there's not many credit card dumps. So I just go to Russian sites and sell it. Generally, full dumps. And then what's full dumps going for right now? Yeah, full dump credit cards. Yeah. They, they sell it by bulk. So, so I want to say, I don't know, it was something... Yeah, for every like 100,000 or something, it's like $4. The, the, the way that it works is, A, the, the, the short answer is whatever the fuck you can get for it. I mean, if somebody's going to pay you money for it, they're going to pay you money for it. Generally, um, they pay money if it's been validated already and you can prove that and if it's really close to it being dumped because as soon as somebody starts using it, even the validation stuff, credit, credit card companies and, and banks have gotten really good at fraud detection, right? Uh, they've taken all of the issue on themselves. You know, if, if our identity gets stolen, um, does Experian take that, that on them? No, fuck you. We're, we're the product, right? Or Equifax or TransUnion. Um, but if we lose our credit card, at least the banks take on that kind of thing. So really, it's, it's, if it's real, it's up to date. Full dumps will get you a decent chunk of change uh, on the open market. Um, the closer it is to the dump, as long as it, you can either sell it to the single buyer which will get you a chunk of money, but it's usually less than what you could sell if you break it up. The problem is if you break it up, people will start, you try to say, hey, hey, hold off for at least a week. They don't think you fucking spend that right away because it, it, yeah, just fucking, you know, it, it, becomes a, it becomes a game theory. The idea of, okay, I can buy it here and I'm going to sit on it for a week, but then in, as soon as that guy uses it, mine are done. So everybody rushes it no matter what you say. Um, I don't know, just whatever the fuck you can get for it. If you're, I'm just curious. You're welcome. All right, what else? Yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah, you. You raise your hand. What if your password contains letters from another language? If that other language is in an area that speaks that language, chances are I'm going to tailor my, my dictionaries to that, uh, to that uh, location, right? Um, absolutely. If you want to put emojis into it, um, you want to put, you know, umlauts or whatever the fuck you want uh, in an area that doesn't have it. Yes, it adds a little bit of randomness. Look, any kind of entropy that you can introduce into a password that you can remember, by all means, use it. Honestly, um, put in whatever the max number is, perfectly random jumble stored in a password wallet, and then have a really long passphrase on the password wallet. But absolutely do that. Chances are, I would probably miss yours but I wouldn't necessarily care about it. I'd be going for someone else, but at least it keeps you out of it. So yeah, if you want to do like an alt Unicode shit login, if the system handles it, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So even Hashcat will, will spit out hex if you're doing full, you can do full all carriage, et cetera. Okay, I think that's about it. Let's go ahead and conclude right now. I'm going to get smashed on Wednesday night. I love not having a corporate job. All right. Yes. If you're buying, I'll do whatever you need. Hey, everybody online, thank you very much for attending Pwn School. Uh, Phil, do you have any closing remarks that you want to do? I'll kick it off. All right. Oh, you're very welcome. He said thank you to me. Yeah. Hey, thank you guys for coming on out and listening to this talk. Uh, I greatly appreciate that.